Don't tell me he grabbed. Interrogation rooms hold some of the most horrifying, Bro, saddening, nah, and life-changing moments in history. So here are some of the craziest interrogation moments of all time. Oh, no. Starting out with Thomas Robinson, a 27-year-old facing life in prison after shooting a 17-year-old. But Thomas well. wasn't right. going down easily. In fact, here. he was determined to make the cops' lives as difficult as he could in the most dangerous ways imaginable. As the policeman moves to handcuff him, Thomas leans over and glances at the holster on the cop's waist, where he gets an idea that I could like end that in so death for him for that, and the officer. You know that. I fed it stupid, though. Are you gonna leave your fire? <laughs> Yeah, I'm good. You couldn't get it. Thomas made a leap for the cop's gun, but due to safety features built into the holster, he wasn't able to get it what down. Safety features. After a short struggle, two more cops entered the room with tasers to subdue him. Hey, and he was eventually restrained it, without further issue. This obviously shooting, just looks like a case where the suspect wanted to escape and was prepared to do so by any means necessary. But take another listen to what he's saying as he's fighting with the cops. <laughs> If he was really trying to escape, it's unlikely he'd be repeating the words kill me from the get-go. Instead, it's possible that Thomas was so terrified of his sentence and the position he was in that he made the radical move to scare the officers in hopes that they'd shoot him and spare him from what's to come. Bringing a firearm into an interrogation room is an incredibly foolish idea, and the majority of police departments forbid it for the safety of the detectives. But it seems this Las Vegas Police Department also forgot about that rule and come incredibly close to seeing the consequences. Clothing's about to drop. Link in the description. Go buy some sh man. We got bottoms, red. We got hoodies, gray, dark gray. Hoodies, red. Bottoms, gray as well. First 10 orders will be refunded. Simple as that, you know what I'm saying? Everyone stay safe. Give your Marge a kiss for me, innit? I got pot noodle right now. This man convicted of killing a two-year-old boy. I was about to say whatever this did must have been terrible. You know, I was about to say that. Oh my. Actually God. managed to retrieve the gun from the detective's holster, resulting ridiculous. in a mad scramble to get it back off him. It took three separate officers and multiple punches to the head to reclaim the firearm. Somehow, nobody was hurt, multiple but Ryan Waller wasn't so lucky as his story ends in a truly horrifying way after he was brought in for interrogation with a bullet still stuck in his head. Huh? You're telling no me way. they shot you with a revolver in your eye? Yes. Yeah. Is it a BB gun? No, it was a real gun, man. It was just a revolver. They shot you in the eye. You wouldn't be talking to me right now. What? Because most likely you'd be dead. But little did police officers know, he was actually telling the truth. As while 18-year-old Ryan was being mocked by detectives, he was suffering from a gunshot to the head and experiencing a brain bleed that could end his life at any moment. Oh my I'm gonna go God. back to sleep and try to go back to bed. You're not going back to bed. On the 23rd of December 2006, two men broke no into Ryan way. Waller's house lack, lack, looking lack. for revenge for a past argument. Ryan heard the noise at the door, but when he went to investigate, a hand reached inside and shot him twice in the eye. The two men, Richie and Larry Carver, then entered his house and I shot Richie. Ryan's girlfriend, Heather, Must killing her instantly. Uh, By some miracle, 18-year-old Ryan that. survived and was able to talk to police when they arrived hours later. Given he He'd just been shot in the head. He told them he had no idea what happened, but instead of being taken straight to the hospital, he was taken to the police station and interrogated for the longest hour of his life. Before the interview started, Ryan was left in the room alone. He squirmed in pain for 20 minutes straight, and worse yet, he was handcuffed to the desk and unable to scream for help. Mm. That's so Man. Ryan is obviously not okay, but the detectives begin the interrogation anyway. You know why you're down here, Ryan? You have no idea why you're down here, mm -hmm. Okay. Child, why I don't know what happened. Okay. 
So I'm going to read you something to make sure that you understand your rights. Okay. Well, hurry up and read it. Read silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. What's the um, highest grade you went through school? I don't know. I just want to go home. Oh, you're, you're not going to go home right now. What's the highest grade that you completed? B? No. Not, not grade, <laughs> as in letter Nah, grade. he's off last, asking, bro. He's off a plug. Did you graduate bro. high school? That's what happens when there's a bullet no. in your head. Do you know how to read and write, Ryan? Yeah. The way the detective is talking to Ryan implies that he knows something is wrong. He's raising his voice slightly, slowing down, and talking in very simplified language just as you would a child. Yet even with the massive red mark around Ryan's face and the dazed responses he's giving, the detective still decides that nothing is wrong and continues questioning Please him. Please tell me they, 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 they got this guy gone, Finn. They got the detective gone. There's no mm. way. They got him, they got him, they packed him up. No. You know, right, you know a girl named Heather? Um, the one that lives there right now? I guess, I don't know. If her name's Heather, what's her last name? I don't know which name she's trying to use as her last one. She's trying to have a real last as her nickname, so I don't know. What nickname does she go by? She probably wants the last name, Kyman. Kyman? How old is Heather? 16 or 17. What happened to your face? I don't know. You told the officer just a few minutes ago that someone hit you. Do you remember who hit you? I think it was Heather. Why would Heather hit you? It was an accident. I forgot why. What was an accident? Heather's last name? No. What was an accident? Nah, he, nah he's, he's, gone, he's, gone, he's gone. He's gone. They need, they need to get that bullet out of his head now. Like she just hit me in an accident. She was giving Christina a head. She was what? She was helping Christina with her hair or something. I don't know. Who's Christina? She's on the couch. You know what? I feel pain for this brother. You Christina's know. on the couch? Ryan and Heather lived with another person lying. whose name isn't public. There's a possibility that it's the Christina he's referring to here, but either way, nobody else was home at any point of the night of the attack. Ryan is clearly suffering traumatic brain injury, and yeah. it's astonishing that the detective isn't connecting the dots. Even if it was just blunt force like Ryan is telling him, he still should be checked out by a doctor given how he's acting. There's no way that... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to But of there's course, no way that's, that's not how it happens. Instead, you know it saying? somehow gets even more messed up. What happened last night? I don't know. You don't know? I really don't. I just want to go to sleep and go to sleep. Who was in the house when you went to sleep? That. Sometimes you just want to go to sleep and go Christina to sleep. Christina and Heather. Christina and Heather. Mm hmm. And Christina was on the couch? Heather was. Heather was on the couch. You told me Christina was on the couch just a minute ago. I don't know, man. I really don't. I really don't. I just want to go and go to sleep, man. Well, Ryan, you're not going to go anywhere. Nah, this didn't take me what happened in your house last night? Mm-mm. Why, what happened? I don't know what happened. You're all beat up. So tell me what happened. I don't know. I just want to go to sleep, man. There's what? a dead girl in your living room. She's dead? Yes. Heather? The girl on the couch is dead? I don't know if she's on the couch, she's dead. Wait, did this guy even do anything? Well, these people I'm came over, Richie and his dad, with shooting arrow bow and darts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They hit me and her with those. That's it. And Heather wasn't there. And Eric wasn't there. It was just me and Heather. And then what happened? And that's it. Richie and his dad tried to break in to the back. Richie and dad? His dad? Mm-hmm. Who's Richie? Oh my oh. god, this guy keeps asking well, bad questions, bro. He Richie. used to live there. I mean, he's an interrogator, but... Was he a roommate of yours? He used to be. Bad they hit questions, you? Yeah. Bro. Now it's Richie that hit you, not Heather? No, Richie and his dad. Why? Because they were trying to get their stuff. I don't know why. And they had some kind of bow and arrows? They each had two revolvers, and they didn't let off any shells. Okay, you just said they had bow and arrows. Now they have revolvers? No, That's what I meant. They have revolvers. That, that, he didn't say they have bow and arrows. They have revolvers. Yes. And then what happened? And then they shot us with those. They shot both of you? 
Yeah. Where'd they shoot you at? I got shot in the eye. You I got think. shot in the eye? I think so. With a revolver? I think. I don't know, man. I don't know. Then what happened? I don't know. You don't know a lot. Ryan. Yeah, because there's a bullet in his f***ing brain. Oh, like, I really come don't. on. I'd Make like to much. see this detective yeah, try and articulate yeah, yeah. himself Funny anywhere reason. near as Ryan is in this situation. He's managed to recount the exact sequence of events as well as the perpetrator's names with the revolver bullet still in saying. his brain. He's, he's it does right sound like an unbelievable story and that's probably why the cop is essentially laughing at him by now. But that still doesn't excuse any part of what's going on. He's well, obviously- if you're is in the room with you, the person you interrogate, he says, I got shot in the head with a revolver. You don't want to check and make sure that that's like... He's distressed, in pain, false, and needs to go to the hospital. But he's still more than half an hour away from any form of salvation. Ryan, why don't you tell me what really happened there? Because I don't believe... I really don't know, man. I really don't. I don't know. I can tell you anything, I swear. Well, I want you to tell me the truth. That's all I want. Richie and his dad came there. And I don't know why. I don't know why. He's... I don't know why, but they put me in sleeping hold, and like they put me in sleeping hold with the arrows and shit. Like I lived through the sh that crap. You're you're all over the board here. Number one, you're saying bows and arrows, you're saying revolvers, and you're saying some other thing. And they you're saying they shot you in the eye, okay? They shot you with a revolver in your eye. Yeah, yes. that's what you said. And that's Is it. it a BB gun? No, no, it was a real gun, man. It was, it was just a revolver. They shot you in the eye. With a revolver, you wouldn't be talking to me right now. Yeah, well, he is. Most likely, so... you be dead. Oh, but That's what I thought too, man. I really don't know. I really don't know, and I just want to go back to sleep and try to go back to bed. You're not going back to bed. Okay? Now nah, this interrogate is. That's not going to happen. What happened bro, to Heather? Needs to hurry up, bro. Heather I'm got have to shot. Skip through and Where did she get shot? Chat. chat do we skip through? You let her sleep? Yes. This does not make sense, Ryan. I know I didn't mean to, man. I'm sorry. I didn't know she was passing out. That's because I got shot wrong once, too, and I was going to pass out. Okay, this is now, not before. You're saying right now you've been shot. Yes. In the eye. Yes. yes. Sir. With the revolver. Yes, sir. All right. Ryan, you need to start telling me the truth because your story doesn't make sense. I'm trying, man. I don't know. What happened with you and Heather? Nah, this is. Night? I can't lie, this is pissing me off, bro. Her dad came and shot I wish I could just go there, lick my hand, and just slap the top of the brother's head. And shot her. Mm hmm. Her dad shot her. Mm hmm. Alright. And then leaves. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And what did you do? Nothing. I don't know. I tried to go back to sleep. <laughs> After you've been shot? Mm hmm. In the eye? Mm hmm. You didn't know enough to call 911. Mm -mm. Ryan, look at me. Ryan. Yes. I don't know, man. Freaky ass. That's what I say when I'm fing looking at it. I don't know. Why did you shoot Heather, Ryan? Good. I didn't shoot Heather. She was already shot once by her brother, I swear. Richie. Yes. Richie shot his own sister. Yes, I swear. That's it. So that not me. And you've been shot in the eye. Yes. Put your, put, your legs, put your legs down. Put your legs down. Bring, bring your face closer. Oh, my head hurts. Okay. Yeah, be, be right back. Oh, so now he's actually going to go get someone to look at him. Finally, the detective at least no considers way. the fact that Ryan might be in some form of physical distress. He leaves the room to ask for an ambulance and returns momentarily to try and get a few more details about the shooting. Ryan clarifies that Heather isn't related to Richie or his dad, and that he's got no idea why they attacked him that evening. Ten minutes later, the fire department arrives to take a look at Ryan's injury. He's acting uh, like he has a serious head injury, which would make sense. But you guys confirm Ryan. Yeah, we'll take him. I don't know why. Yeah, we can tell. Yeah, that all. Has it been like that before or just happened tonight? It's been like this for like a day or so. What, so it happened, what, the other night? I don't know. You don't know what happened. Were there guns around? This kid Eric did it. I don't know how he did it exactly. I might have been shot. I don't know.
Ryan gets his blood pressure taken, and finally, after 56 minutes of unnecessary and ultimately deadly interrogation, he is taken to the hospital. Upon inspection at the hospital, doctors immediately realized his status was critical and that he also had indeed been shot in the eye. They wow. also told his father that he'd contracted an infection that could have been prevented had he received proper care. Wow. Ryan stayed at the hospital for 35 days and lost part of his brain and his left eye. So because the interrogator didn't want to just believe him and be like, you know what, he says he's been shot. Let me call someone, yeah? Instantly, he went to the longer out for almost an hour. My man lost his eye. Yeah, I would have, I would I can't even say that word out loud, but I would have R-worded his... Worst yeah, of all, though, he experienced loud, regular but... seizures from the day he left the hospital until yeah, 2016, so when one finally took his life. Richie and Larry were both given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Right wow. Wow. Ryan's father also sued the police department, but as is so often the case, he only received a fraction of the punishment, less than three years in prison. Many people believe this officer should be charged with assault and possibly even murder. Yeah! The f Chat, let me know in the comments below, bro. Like, what, what do you think the punishment should be for this, brother? Because no f fucking way. Nah, bro, something's gonna happen to him. Alright, chap. Top 8 wildest court remembers of all time. I'm trying to think over here. <laughs> what? Bro, I'm bugging out, bro. The hell? I told him to shut up. I'm trying to think. Bro, I'm trying to think of a way out. It's a little bit too late for that, my friend. My friend. My friend. This is Leonid Greiser, who's on trial right. in Russia for stabbing his own sister, huh? Mariana Karol. To death. The 18 year old confessed to the brutal murder following his arrest by oh my God, that's so sad. Satan ordered him to do it. The dangerous Wait. criminal is confined to a secure chat. We've seen this before. We've seen this before. We've seen him before. Let's see what he got though. Let's see what he got though. As he was sentenced to mandatory psychiatry. Where are you seeing this going on channel? While the if you guys don't know, of where you it? caused Greiser's body to spring into action to escape. Some defendants, like Diana Lovejoy, All right. the opposite challenge. Love I don't like the way she was looking into the camera. Bad freaky, bro. Murder and attempted murder for a botched murder for hire plot. What? Her soon to be ex husband was shot in 2016. The mother of one who was known for. No way. You would not even think that she would do YouTube such a thing. Videos on cooking before her arrest, stood accused of hiring her gun instructor. Oh, you mind like quavers or no? Let me know in the comments below your favorite packet of crisps. Ma'am, my and these. You might know I always eat when I'm recording, innit? Just cause like, I might as well, you know what I'm saying, chat? When I'm live. $120,000. Huh? Following a dramatic trial, Lovejoy has been called back into the courtroom in Vista, San Diego. To hear the jury's verdict. It's a tense moment. And Diana bows her head toward the desk. I feel like we're in the cinema right now watching this. I'm so immersed into this. Lovejoy's shock. You want to turn the evident. music down? Her eyes widen as she looks at her defense attorney in horror. She continues to look stunned and aghast as the forewoman reads on. And she leans back in her seat with her eyes closed as she tries to process what is happening. Given the cold-blooded nature of the crime she has just been found guilty of. Nah, yeah, she's bugging out. It's sped up. She looks like a bug. All right, we're gonna need to take a break. Oh, she passed out. Man, I'm there. No, she really just like stopped moving. In case you missed it, watch again as she disappears out of the frame here before being quickly caught and lifted back into her seat by the prison guard. Although her eyes are open, Lovejoy seems to be in a category. Nah, she's state. lying. She's lying. She's lying. She's about uncontrollably. The prison guard attempts to get her she's into a position, but a seemingly rigid Lovejoy collapses to the ground. She's lying, bro. Still I can tell when Fake sleeps, bro. I used to do that shit in the car. Clothing's about to drop. Link in the description. Go buy some shit, man. We got bottoms, red. We got hoodies, gray, dark gray. Hoodies, red. Bottoms, gray as well. First 10 orders will be refunded. Simple as that, you know what I'm saying? Everyone stay safe. Give your Marge a kiss for me, innit? Receiving medical attention so my mom would take me upstairs. The courtroom, who thinks she might be suffering from shock. Though prosecutor Jody Breton suspects the whole incident could have been faked. Mm -hmm. I am skeptical because I just, again, she's somebody who will hire a person to kill her ex-husband. Lovejoy is taken from the court to await she's a widow on a stretcher. After recovering from what ER doctors deem to be just a fainting episode, Lovejoy is brought back to court, where she is sentenced to 26 years to life. Hey! 
Mm. Yeah, that's everything. All of your shit that you've done in your life, gone. Finished. Now repent. Some incidents of malingering in court are more dramatic than others. In the case of Kison Wilkins could be the most dramatic yet. Wilkins is representing himself in an Ohio court. this bold headed ass brother just drove. Charges of assault and weapons violations in connection with the 2004 shooting. Following a dramatic first day of the trial, where the judge needed to clear the courtroom a number of times due to Wilkins' antics, day two is already <laughs> started off on the wrong foot. The hearing kicks off with the judge Wait, asking what, Wilkins what bloody antics is this guy today. doing to make everyone clear the courtroom? Which Wilkins replies that he does not. He tells the judge that he needs more time to prepare his defense, to which the judge admonishes him, telling him that he had months to prepare. You've had months to research this matter. This is why I suggested to you that you have counsel. Not willing to give Wilkins any more time. Nah, he's doing his shit. Dolo, he's standing on business. He calls a policeman to the stand as a witness. Once they have concluded their questioning, Wilkins begins his cross examination. And you won't believe what happens next. E. Watch again as Wilkins falls to the ground. That brother is sleeping. Do you guys see this man right there? He is sleeping. The court deputies rush to his aid. The judge. He didn't even. Broski, the guy had dropped right in front of him and he's just like. And he went back to sleep. He doesn't care. <laughs> what the hell? Already familiar with Wilkins' flair for drama seems unperturbed and she calmly calls for the courtroom to be cleared yet again. The officers, who are trained medics, lift him back up into his chair, and a nurse checks him over, deeming there to be nothing wrong with him. See here how Wilkins sits, slumped in the chair, seemingly unconscious, as the judge asks- Nah, do you, do these guys think they're so slick, you know? appears to be normal, and he seems to be acting as if he is asleep. The situation becomes even more bizarre as a deputy waves smelling salts under Wilkins' nose. <laughs> a remarkable change causing him to suddenly throw his head backwards and make a miraculous recovery. Hey, they caught my man lacking. His heart attack. The judge carries on with the hearing as Wilkins continues to sit in his chair with his head thrown back, and she reprimands him for his continued disruptive behavior. Despite nah. being healthy, Wilkins is eventually lifted from the seat. This is some prison break. I know, I know what he was trying to do, bro. Ultimately, his behavior didn't do him any favors. He is sentenced to 42 years in prison. If you think... What did he do? Your trap? What do you think he did? Because I don't think they said it. And if they did, I'm just Wilkins so. Were I'm so deep into these porn cocktail crisps that I don't understand. To escape the scales of All right, Nicholson. 35 year old Nicholson is appearing at Christie's Beach Magistrates Court in Adelaide, South Australia, for a bail hearing in relation to weapons offenses and driving charges that he is facing. He has a long history of petty crime and drug use. And before attending court today, he got high on. Means. <laughs> Magistrate Sue O'Connor announces that Nicholson's bail is being revoked. Hey, he's re the drugged up defendant stands up and pleads with her, putting his hands in the air. <laughs> Nicholson was expecting to leave the court on bail again today. <laughs> and he's not happy to hear that you this is the case. The judge orders him to sit down, but Nicholson becomes more irate and agitated. As shocking as Nicholson's earlier behavior has been, suddenly, Things take a more dramatic turn. A sheriff's officer enters the dock to take control of the situation and calm Nicholson down. Oh. But instead, Nicholson jumps up onto the side of the dock, trying to climb. Eee! The glass panel the oh, I know that hurt his leg so bad. Two officers grab him in an attempt to get him down, and he wrestles with one of them, locking arms as he falls back into the dock. He quickly springs back up and vaults to the dock, landing on the desk as a police prosecutor wrangles him to the ground. Pulling if you're an officer, a police officer, like something like that security, it should only take one of you to take a man, um, like a brother down. He doesn't look athletic whatsoever, but his ass is out. You see the way he's trying to get up? Look at this. Back into the dock. He quickly springs back up and vaults to the It should not take more than two guys. Two guys max, that's it. You know what I'm saying? It should not take three, three men. Did brother went in though. Grab him. Yee. Pulling his pants down in the process. But look, he got away. Again. Watch again as Nicholson moves with seemingly superhuman strength to get out of the dock. Superhuman strength? No, bro. Them brothers are just weak, fam. I could have stopped him. 
Big man thing I could have stopped. I want to grab them by the throat, like. Stay right. <laughs> nah, that's gay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so gay. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sitting in the hall outside, storm the courtroom. One woman is holding Nicholson's young son in her arms, and she begs the guards for mercy. You can hear her here screaming and pleading that Nicholson is a sick man. Officers eventually restrain Nicholson. Placing Leave him. Handcuffs. He's a sick Two man. Two of the sheriff's officers involved were injured. Nicholson was jailed for at least 12 months for the escape attempt judge telling him to grow up get clean or face many more years so he only got 12 months because you tried to escape so he wouldn't have had nothing before Allah. he would have just been fine i like chat behind bars oh, i'm bugging well, i'm bugging like nicholson's can be you must not know that i'm fucking i just had to fix it you know that i'm loving some mm. behavior by you know i'm loving it so bizarre that no logical reasoning can be found for it like in the case of christopher teal Teal is appearing before Superior Judge do? Karen Donahue in King County Courtroom, Seattle. The King County Court is charged with KKK. unlawful imprisonment. After an incident, he hey! alleged he followed a woman That's into bad. the bathroom at a car dealership, locked her in a stall, and sexually assaulted her. The victim had dropped her car off for servicing moments before the attack, which was only stopped when dealership employees broke into the stall and pulled Teal, who was six foot three inches tall off the woman. Teal's behavior in custody has been That's erratic nasty, up until now, bro. and he's been involved in a number of violent incidents, he's including nasty, trying to headbutt bro. a detective hey. who was questioning him about the incident at the car dealership. Man said he slapped him. He said, don't talk to me like that. A psychiatric evaluation that was conducted found that he was capable of understanding the criminal charges that had been filed against him. The psychologist concluded that he may be feigning the symptoms of a psychiatric disorder. So today, he's in court for a competency hearing. I could pull, I could pull off the I'm not room and looks around mentally in a unstable. Dazed state. His court-appointed attorney, Reed Berkland, stands next to him. Teal's handcuffs are removed by the jail guard, and the defendant continues to look around in a confused manner. As the prosecutor kicks off the hearing, Teal reaches his arm out towards his defense attorney. <laughs> and the court officer grabs his arm down tells him to stand still. You won't believe what happens next. Teal laughs, and then without warning or provocation, he turns to Berkland again and slaps him sharply. <laughs> he's it. Here it is again. I, Watches one court officer I'm going to jump for so long. The back of the head. Oh my the God. holds him by the shoulders no, he, and they bring him to the ground. This officer eventually manages to get the cuffs back on the 250 pound man. And another officer calls 250 the pound man, brother. He's 6'3. He's no way he's 250. What's 250 pounds in kg? 100 or something. 113. He's 113. Bruv. Courtroom. No For way. Attendant to bring a restraint he looks skinny chair as strap to you oh. into. Chair. The chair. There aren't any restraint chairs to hand, but the officers place a His wood over must his be head. heavy, bro. No cap. Berkland declines to press charges, but he removes himself from the case. But the craziness doesn't end there. Two weeks later, Teal's back in the courtroom again for another competency hearing. This time, he already knows he's about to do some chances, and he's wheeled in front of the judge, strapped into a restraint chair. Before the hearing concludes, Teal interrupts, and unbelievably, he proceeds to complain loudly about the fact that his hair is short in his mugshot. I'd like to know where the f they got that photo of me with my short hair. Because that was on Facebook and I don't have a Facebook. The attorney tries to get back on track. Bro, you're going to jail. Why are you worried about but Facebook, him? over him, asking nonsensical questions. Legitimate questions. Like, do they have access to Google? Teal is eventually deemed competent to stand trial, and after being found guilty, he's sentenced to eight and a half years to life for his crimes. To life. It's clear from the case. Yeah, he's gonna get life. You know why? He's gonna do some stupid lap, something stupid, and then they're just gonna say, "Yeah, you're gonna stay here for the rest of your life, bro." Christopher Teal, that attorneys often I find themselves no. at the receiving end of bad behavior from their clients, but as you will see in the case of Alexis Plunkett, some attorneys fight back in the most serious way. Plunkett's story is already a crazy one. She's a qualified criminal defense and civil rights attorney who runs her own practice in Las Vegas, Nevada. She's used to being on the other side of courtroom operations, defending clients and fighting in their corner. Mm -hmm. and in a way, that is what has landed her oh, in, she dead? in the first place. Wait, what? Plunkett stands accused of two counts of conspiracy to unlawfully possess a cell phone by a prisoner. 12 counts of possession of a cell phone by a prisoner. 12 counts. Crazy. So she's been putting them up her you-know-what and giving them to the prisoners. 
Little freaky girl, fam. She's this is too after freaky, she was found bro. to have handed her cell phone to a client of hers to use while visiting him in the county jail. Oh, right. Nice. She just straight up just gave that, it to him. But the client in question, Andrew Aravalo, is also Alexis Plunkett's boyfriend. Oh, not exactly that makes sense. Judgment calls you would like to see from an attorney. That makes sense. Cell phone charges are a felony offense. Plunkett is facing up to a year in prison for them. That's Plunkett's it? Plunkett's actions and lack of common sense in relation to the matter have been appalling, and it's about to get a whole lot worse for her in court when the investigating officer takes the stand. He testifies that when police seized Plunkett's phone, they found text messages that she had sent to a group of six other attorneys, claiming that she had ordered a hit on Andrew Aravalo. What? I'm not joking. That's why I said the lady said he was going to have me murdered, so I'll take care of business first. My life is in danger, and that's not a joke and i'm not joking so if i get killed you know who it is plunkett finishes the message with the words delete this followed by a smiling emoji when one of the other attorneys Aye, she's called her dumb bro she's she's like that, dopey plunkett responded by saying she wasn't joking she justifies her actions saying that aravalo told her he would have her killed so she wanted to have him killed first oh. judge michael villani questions the officer about the texts oh my God. before offering his own opinion to plunkett which as you would expect, is not very lighthearted. Okay, this is bizarre. There's nothing to say. Who in the right mind would send these texts? This, like I said, I've been doing this since 1982, and I've never even heard of this, let alone seen this. They ain't have text messages in 1982. Some dumb guy, bro. This brother thinks that Apple was out there slanging iPhones in 1980. No, they weren't, bro. That's why you ain't seen nothing like this before. Some donut, man. Despite the process, sometimes, sometimes these judges are bare stupid, you know. For Plunkett to be remanded in custody, she's released on bond. I don't bond. I don't bond. I don't bond. Don't bond. 100 rounds, 100,000. But following in her previous pattern of poor judgment, she <laughs> hey, she looks again. weird, bro. This time, accused bad of devious. one of the witnesses in her case. The charge comes after Plunkett made a post on social media calling a potential witness a snitch. The prosecution Ooh. again asks that her body you a snitch denied, reminding the judge of the nature of the text messages she has said in these texts what she wanted to do she wanted to have mr arabello killed or beaten down severely yeah they shouldn't release her on bond this time releasing her on bond would be the stupidest thing to do yeah there you go Plunkett makes a plea deal with the prosecution pleading guilty to one count of possession of a telecom device by a prisoner in exchange the charges of intimidating a witness are dropped Plunkett is sentenced to three years probation and is prohibited from practicing law for five years. All right, Ultimately, that's not bad. Nevada Supreme Court permanently disbarred Plunkett. Alexis Plunkett. All right, so she lost her job. That's fair. That makes sense. And then she got three years of probation. Plunkett paid a heavy price. Oh, she only lost her job for five years. Then she can get back into it. Similar fashion, Spencer Boston also found himself in hot water for sneaking something into the courtroom that wasn't allowed, but for entirely different reasons. Boston is appearing before Judge Haywood Berry on some relatively light charges. Haywood Berry, and I'm gay, and, and I like vehicle, men. They found the Tennessee man to be in possession. Hey, of my name is uh, Haywood Berry, and uh, I like men. called, and Boston approaches the podium. Stupid ass name, bro. I'm about to have the unbuttoning his jacket to reveal a bright tie-dyed T-shirt. The defense attorney addresses the judge, telling him that Boston has requested to represent himself, while Boston stands patiently. Oh yeah, this brother, he started billing it right in the courtroom. You might remember this. some very strong feelings about the law. And he the people just hate. Law is prior as the was pulled. Look, we've already seen it, but I'm gonna just skip to the part, fam. the court officers even notice what he's doing as he pulls out a joint and puts it into his mouth. Hey, hey, hey! We the people deserve better! In case you missed it... Ah, he's trying to protest. He's trying to protest. For his boldness, Boston gets an additional charge of disorderly conduct and contempt of court. Yeah, look at his teeth, bro. They're bare tiny. He got no lips, no teeth. Bag, I don't even know, bro. I just... As well as a second charge for possession of marijuana. He later gives an interview explaining how he managed to smuggle the offending joint into court without it being discovered. Put off his bum bum. To my, um, my uh, actual chest. Boston spent oh. 10 days in court for contempt before being released on a $3,000 bond. All right. Boston's actions Minor. were considered disrespectful to the court. Sometimes defendants take it to a whole other level and directly target the judge. And that's exactly what happened in the case of Alan McCarty. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is the intro. <laughs> the when he <laughs> Let's see what he does. Child custody case with his ex wife. His kids are removed from him, and he mistakenly believes that a circuit court judge named Stasio Warren is at fault. 
Obviously enraged, McCarty phones the Volusia County Sheriff's Office in Florida to sound off about the situation. Communications, Warhurst. Communications, I'm gay. Wait, what? Crime that's about to happen. Yeah, there's about to be a crime that's gonna happen if my kids don't come back to me, you stupid. Why is he being rude to the judges? Don't want to bring people to courtrooms? I got a gun pointed at your building, sir. What is going on? Who the are you calling, sir? You stupid bitch. Where's your judge warrant at? You gonna bring that bitch out in handcuffs and I'm gonna execute that son of a bitch right in the street? What the hell? What the hell? I'm letting you know I'm gonna shoot this bitch. You gonna give me my kids? Where are you at, sir? Do, do brothers not realize that if they speak like that and they 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 do these actions, that they are never gonna see their kids again because then they're gonna be deemed like a bad parent and a bad human being? And why would you want to put children around people like that? Are they dumb? I just told you I'm outside of her building. Wait for her to get there in the morning. I'm gonna pop a cap in You stupid. Whoa! You know, f this now. What? Why do you have to say that? Officers thankfully managed to track McCarty down and arrest him, charging him with making a threat against a sitting judge. Here well, why did he have to say that? I didn't use the N word. There was no need. There was no need. His volatile nature hasn't calmed down in the intervening months. You threatened my life. Back room. <laughs> Things get more oh strange God. when Cardi is asked to raise his right hand to swear an oath. No, I was not sworn in. Yes, I've never been sworn in this court. So that being said, um, number one, I need to know whether or not you want to be here during the trial process. No. All right. Do you want to testify? No, I doubt this is all being done unconstitutionally, unrightfully. Do you want to be in the room or not? Do you want to sign? What the hell? You're not gay, mid the beast. I think he's gay, mid the beast. The judge admonishes him, setting McCarty off on another. What does admonishing mean? I asked this question in the last video, and you guys told me. What does admonishing mean? Let me know in the comments. Yo, if you're still here, comment down below two tone. Comment down below two tone x red tip x black tip. Yeah. Don't ask why. Don't ask why they call me two tone. <laughs> Bro, trying to think of more customers than I said. Um, no, I'm not standing. I'm resisting. I'm not resisting. I'm just not standing up. Bro, trying to think of more swear words, bro. Yeah, I don't have to stand. All right. Continued outbursts. McCarty spends much of the actual trial in a room behind the courtroom, where he could hear the proceedings through a speaker, yeah. watch through mirrored glass. As Judge Foxman said, he just has to sit there doing nothing. 20 for him. years in prison for threatening the judge, and a further 10 days in jail for his actions in the courtroom. <laughs> so, when the 20 years is up, he's gonna be like, Oh, time to go. They're like, Nah, broski, you got 10 more days in here because of that. He said in the courtroom. The process. Perhaps the most incredible thing about this case is that Judge Warren, who McCarty made the original threats against, wasn't even the judge who made the decision in the custody case. And on top of this, it emerged that McCarty didn't even have custody of the kids to begin with. Take my kids from me and act like that? You win that. Over the course of the. Bro, he didn't even have the kids in the first place. <laughs> what? This is Ronnie O'Neill. He is a double murder suspect in Riverview, Florida. If you think I'm here to play around with y'all, <laughs> Bro, if you don't sit your ass down, you're about to go to jail for life, you f idiots. Italy shot his then girlfriend, Kenyatta yeah. Perry. Following this, he murdered their own daughter by striking her multiple times with a hatchet. She was only nine years old. O'Neill also stabbed their eight year old son before pouring gasoline all over the house and setting it on fire. O'Neill was arrested upon fleeing the burning house. The son was able to escape, but was critically wounded and suffered from burns. The first 911 call on the incident was from the girlfriend who was heard screaming before suddenly hanging up. 
eight minutes I haven't been able to speak call, past 20 seconds because what the f***? After the arrest, <laughs> O'Neill was is psychologically a cleared to represent himself in court. During the trial, he cross-examined his now 11-year-old son, who he stabbed, to which the son explained everything that happened. Oh no. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you too. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? Yes. I did. And how did I hurt you? You stabbed me. O'Neill also accused the prosecution of fabricating evidence. Because he's playing a fraudulent damn recording of me beating Kenyatta Barron. Oh no. I did kill Kenyatta Barron. Oh. After O'Neill was found guilty at See, his he sentencing, just the judge went on to say this was the worst case she's ever seen. This, this is disgusting. This is the worst case ever, ever in my life. And I have seen some horrors. He also stated that he was not sorry for what he did. I am not sorry for something I didn't do, and I am not sorry for the things I did do. This is not the right moment to be standing on Bennett. If I tell I did not the right moment to be standing on Bennett for her. This is crazy. O'Neill was given a total of three life sentences plus 90 years without parole. And for O'Neill's son, he was adopted by the detective who cared for him the night of the murder. Number five, Nicholas Number Lindsay. Five. In these court Your cases, mom. a lot of the time you are dealing with cold-blooded killers. Killing another human being is not that big of a deal to them. This, so a lifelong punishment behind bars doesn't bother them one bit either. In this video, mm -hmm. rather than intensely waiting for the verdict, this team seems to be scratching his elbow. He looks as if he's bored at school and daydreaming away while the court decides his fate. Then he finally realizes where he is and pretends to listen. But the worst is yet to come. <laughs> when the final verdict is delivered, he grins. He's actually smiling as if to say to the judge, you can't get to me. This teen didn't just kill anyone, he killed Pretty a cool. cop. A police officer oh, was called to someone's house where this kid was in the backyard holding a brick. They suspected he was trying to burgle the home. The police officer arrived and the teen was caught by surprise. It is believed that the officer was shot while reaching for a notepad, which the kid might have oh, mistaken for a gun. Uh, Had he waited a second later, he would not This is literally like a vice versa situation, you know what I'm saying? Like, that man there, she's the black people trying to reach for something and then they get shot. Now the guy's like, you know what, Nicholas, Nicholas, he was like, you know what, this, I'm switching the verdict. I've been in this situation. What he did then is he fired, in his own words, three more rounds. He pointed at the officer's belly. Ooh, and he looked like he had a Crawford. big belly. Uh, he, was, he was struck four times, possibly five times. Detectives say Lindsay ditched that handgun when he ran, possibly into Brooker Creek near Tropicana Field. The grin shows absolutely no sign of remorse. The victim's family even commented on the grin in their statement after the trial. A family member said, Justice was served and I'm glad it's over and it just kind of proves to me that he's an animal as he sat there smiling. Even his mother didn't seem too bothered. She simply said, It's what the judge ordered, so that's what it is. It is what it is. It looks like he inherited his mother's devil-may-care attitude. His mother's indifference is probably because he's been a problem child for most of his life. Before the murder, he was involved in a series of crimes, including theft and trespassing. Personally, I think this reaction proves that he's a genuine psychopath. As we'll explore later, psychopaths are pretty cunning and like to hide their emotions and resemble other humans. When I think of a psychopath, I just think of some white crazy man. I don't know why, that's like the first image that pops into my head. What's the first image that pops into your head, Chuck? In this clip, he lays it out front and center. He has no remorse whatsoever and is happy to reveal his own true colors. How can you be it's happy about killing, killing someone? Number though, four, TJ Lane. Bro. I dare someone try to jump at me like that. I'm jumping this over that judge's desk so quick. Who is facing charges regarding a domestic Thank violence you, order filed by her husband? Melissa Hardwick, Melissa you know. Melissa is before Judge Jennifer Edwards. I've taken your statements in your petition as part of your testimony, but I need you to tell me briefly, in your own words, what happened to cause you to ask for a domestic violence order. Yes, Your Honor. Until things took an unexpected turn when Melissa began talking back order to on the judge. Melissa. She hadn't really had anything personal up until that point. She got out of jail in April. And she started... My personal life is no, no, no. your business, John. It has nothing to do with Ms. Hardwick. 
No. You will be held in contempt of this court if you I become don't, disruptive. I don't care. Despite the judge warning oh, wow. Melissa that she would be held I don't in contempt care. if she continued speaking, Melissa refused to stop talking and interrupted the proceedings. Okay, However, locked up for 20 years. Case, Cook's sentence was later reduced to 11 years. Cook's oh, okay. case may be touching. However, but 11 years it is wasn't crazy, the only time though. a courtroom went crazy during sentencing. All of her prime years are gone. Case of Alan Boston. He just facing charges for marijuana possession in Tennessee. And then he just Boston lit one up. called up to the bench to discuss his sentence and determine how he wanted to plead to the case. I spoke to Mr. Boston. He said he wants to represent himself in this case. I told him today was to the ring, but if he was guilty, not guilty by day. Yes, sir. I think it's very unfair, the marijuana law here. Um, I think we the people deserve better because marijuana is a very harmless drug and it's been around for ages since the 80s and 90s. Uh, I've heard that for only all my life, so don't go any further on that. Yes, sir. And I've heard that baloney. All I know is yes, that state still has it against the law. I swore to uphold the laws and I have to uphold the laws. As yes, judge, sir. It probably is unfair, but. Yeah, I he's about to roll in front of the judge. To get that change. Yes, sir. And if you get a change. He surprised everyone by reaching into his front pocket, pulling out a joint, and lighting it right there in the courtroom. Yes, you heard that correctly. He lit a joint in front of everyone. The incident didn't go unnoticed. Court officers swiftly intervened and grabbed Boston, escorting him out of the courtroom. <laughs> I can't he's a bad man for that. Nah, he's fine for that. County Sheriff Robert nah, he's a bad man, I can't lie. The scene I rate that. I can't lie. I rate that. Things he had ever witnessed. I rate that. However, I rate that though. You can't. You can't like dislike that. You know what I'm saying? Like he's just doing charge, his own thing. He's just vibing. That's cool. Charge for simple possession. His teeth are crazy though. He looks like Chucky or something. No, he's that, hideous. He found in of he's court not hideous. He's hideous, man. As a result, that's a new word that we're that we're that we're transforming. What does it mean? That we're creating. Certainly left a lasting impression. He's hideous, man. However, some would argue that the case of Arthur Booth is far more memorable. Arthur Booth, a 49-year-old career criminal, is facing charges of <laughs> Why is he smiling? You're going to jail for 49 years. Resisting arrest in Miami, Florida. Additionally, he has three arrest affidavits for reckless driving, oh, property wow. damage, and leaving the scene of a crash without serious injury. So basically, he just can't drive. So basically, reckless driving, so he was swerving in and out, driving recklessly. And then the brother decided to crash into a f***ing property right there it says property damage and then he left the scene of the crash so recklessly drove into a house and then just left like nothing happened come on man arrest this brother please get him Injury. off the streets take his license away one of his take something away from this guy like what's going on while driving a vehicle reported stolen in a robbery instead of complying with the authorities he okay so first he stole the car then he recklessly drove the car into somebody's house then he crashed into the house and then he left the house Lock this brother up, Engaged please. In chase. Come on, man. His Just lock him up, Booth's man. Legal at this point, I feel like I should be a judge. Court Order! Judge Mindy Order in the, judge the court! Three thousand dollars. Now he wants to suck me, really. If he couldn't afford it. Yeah, I'm getting arrested okay, myself. Mr. Booth, I have a question for you. I yes, ma'am. Did you go to Nautilus for middle school? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry to see you there. I always wondered what happened to you, sir. Oh my goodness. This, this is the nicest kid in middle school. Oh my goodness. It was then that Booth oh, recognized wow. his former classmate in the judge's robe. Overwhelmed with remorse and humiliation. Do you see? Nah, but do you see the way life works? This guy doing up reckless driving, whatever it is, right? Man's doing up stealing cars and she is she's in she's a fing judge. Do you know what I'm saying? Now I know some brothers in the comments are gonna be like, but because he black, he had what opportunities. Then no, no, no. there's black judges. Come on, chat. Down Come on, chat. Come Booth on. Resolved to confront his addiction issues and forge a brighter future. Fast forward ten months to when Booth is to be released from incarceration, along with his family. Oh, he looks Booth happy though. By an old Aww. Friend. However emotional you think Arthur Booth's case was. That's so cute. Judge Murphy nah, that's Andrew so Weinstock cute. Don't ruin it. Don't show us something money. crazy. Nah, no, don't ruin it, please. Andrew Weinstock and his client are present before Judge John Murphy in Brevard County, Florida. Two charges: assault and resisting. You have the public defender. Public defender. What do you want to do? What they bought. They have. I'm not waiting. All right. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? I'm not waiting. 
You want to set up for trial, set up for trial. The judge, looking to clear his schedule, suggested that Weinstock waive his client's right to a speedy trial. Still, the attorney stood firm, committed to ensuring justice for his client. Oh, the wow. tension between the judge and the attorney escalated, with neither finding common ground. You know, if I had a rock, state. I would throw it at you. <laughs> Stop <laughs> pissing me off. Just sit down. I'll take care of you. What? I need your help. No, sit down. What does I have to do with anything? I, right to be here and I, have a right to I said sit down. If you want to fight, let's go out back and I'll just beat your ass. ass. Unable to contain his frustration, the judge proposed a physical fight outside no the courtroom. Way. No the way. No way. The fucking judge proposed a physical fight. Man, drop. If you want, Sham, I'll give it you. <laughs> if you want, Sham, I'll give it you. In a physical altercation outside the No, they didn't. Fortunately, the court camera could not capture the fight visually, but the sounds of their scuffle echoed through the recording. Eventually, a deputy intervened, separating the two combatants. Upon returning to the courtroom, Judge Murphy received applause and cheers from the defendants, who were evidently entertained by the spectacle. After catching his breath, the judge resumed the proceedings without Weinstock's disruptive presence. Unknown to Weinstock, Judge Murphy had a background as an ex-military personnel. He was... Nah, Judge Murphy has been waiting for this day his whole life. He trained in the army, became a judge, and he was like, I can't wait till one of these attorneys try to piss man off, blood, just so he can stick it in his f***ing ass, bruv. He was a United States Army colonel and had served with the special forces in various countries. Despite his military achievements, the Florida Supreme Court found his behavior during the altercation with Weinstock appalling, and he was suspended. Judge Murphy's actions were crazy. Nah, that's funny. However, Nothing could have prepared you for the case of 18 Bro, this guy keeps starting and stopping it like, is he trying to break out? Yeah, he looks Russia. scary. I can't lie. If I see my man in, 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 in the road, I'm Ariana leaving, bro. Carole, who was found naked with multiple stab wounds in their shared apartment. He freaky. claimed that Satan He's had ordered him to commit hell, the blood. act. Eyewitnesses reported that before the police arrived, Grazer undressed. Yeah, I can't lie. I just want to put a bullet through his skull, but I'm scared it's going to ricochet and hit my dick. You know, dumb ones there. You might never think about that. Not just me. Right. Monarch's symbols with blood on his sister's body and his head. He pleaded to be freed from Satan's influence, claiming that the devil incited him to kill his sister. Although his actions were horrible, Grazer's behavior in court was terrifying. Grazer finds himself in the Shubinsky court. Your head can't fit through there, bro. Cage, precisely what Grazer had planned. Although Grazer seems to have settled down for the moment. He manages to slip no through the way. slats at the top of the bulletproof security dock. However, police officers quickly intervened, using batons and tasers to subdue him. Oh no! Despite losing his trousers in the process, Grazer was eventually tasered and forced to return to the dock. Once They're Grazer Russian. Yeah, that man Russian. Time, Russian don't play around. Provide a complete confession for the murder boldly expressing no remorse for his heinous actions. Hey! If you thought these courtroom moments Wanker. were shocking, you'd be amazed. Nah, I can't lie. Some of you man in prison need to... You man need a d*** in your ass, blood. I swear down. That's the only way this thing's gonna get settled, fam. So wood up your bum. This first case is a wild one. Richard Jones spent 17 years in jail for a robbery he didn't commit. No way! However... Every eyewitness to the crime. Yeah, I would be pleased. So, the question is, how can Jones be innocent if everyone saw? They him must have. Do they, it? No way they didn't pay the brother out. Well, pay close attention because there's more to this mystery than first meets the eye. Nearly 20 years ago, Jones was charged with aggravated robbery in Kansas City, Kansas, after being accused of trying to steal a purse in a parking lot. Jones had provided an alibi, and no physical evidence ever linked him to the crime. So the how did they lock him up? The suspect was thin to medium build, tan with dark hair pulled back, and out of a photo lineup of six mugshots, Jones was identified. That oh, that's so landed him behind bars. No DNA no physical evidence and a solid alibi were all overpowered by the victim selecting Richard out of the lineup. So if, bro, I swear this, the alibi should just, should just, to just, 
What's the word, fam? It should it decapitate described. you from the situation, Alla. Well, I'm eating great. Would you believe me if I told you you've seen two different people? Believe it. We are back with a case oh. of mistaken identity that forced a man to spend 17 years behind bars and the discovery casting doubt on his guilty verdict. I believe it was a striking resemblance. It just blew me away. Couldn't let someone else's mistake uh, make me waver in my faith and and, 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 and never make me shy away from what That's was so real. He spent and, and 17 the years of his life, his prime I mean, years. After 15 in jail. years of time served, oh, Jones contacted rough. the Midwest Innocence Project. The Innocence Project helped him find that man, and when they did, people's minds were blown. During that visit, Mr. Jones actually said to the students, I keep getting mistaken for this guy named Ricky Amos. The victim was brought back in to point out the suspect, but with Jones and Amos standing next to each other. Jones and Amos had never met until a hearing last Wednesday when witnesses admitted they couldn't tell the two apart and the judge ordered Jones released. Judge oh my God. Recognized that an injustice had been done. Everyone did. The victim did. Um, the original That's so did. sad, man. Uh, and came to testify that. I can't lie. If they locked me up for 17 years, yeah, I'd be, nah, I'd be mega, mega fucking twin, human. Right? To see these two men, it's like looking in a mirror, except they never met, though they were both housed in the same prison. Insane. What are the chances? Why is this, why is this real life face crooked for him? He has the same legal <laughs> name as you. And out of all places, he ended up being housed in the same prison as you. Same legal name is Brazy. So yeah. I'm really being here it's been 17 years. You know, something I didn't do, but I'm thankful. He still has his girl? I'm definitely built. Now nah, his girl was getting nuts in him. Like several times, she had like eight abortions while you were in there, Roski. For the challenge, you know, just living my life starting over. Someone got to let him know that his girl was getting drilled for 17 years. Maybe like 15 imagine. years. Spending more than four decades in prison as an innocent person convicted of a triple. It was 17 years. Oh, this is someone different. Oh. But for one Missouri man, that has been his reality. When he entered prison, he could walk. He now relies on a wheelchair. Had absolutely nothing to do with these murders. Monday, a judge in Florida posthumously exonerated four black men known as the Groveland Four. Deal in disbelief. This is the moment that he thought might never come for the man at the center of one of the longest wrongful conviction That's cases so sad, in U.S. Man. history. 43 years. 43 years. 43 years. Kevin Strickland has waited 43 years for this day. Well, I'm not angry. I'm disgusted. Mm -hmm. Dreams you, broken as you should be. Moments stolen. Prosecutors turned defenders. That's terrible. Corruption seeping from the highest level. This next case doesn't only break historical records, but will break your hearts as well. Kevin Strickland, now 63, was incarcerated in 1979. At 22 years of age, the state of Missouri charged him with first and second degree murder in a brutal triple homicide. Kevin pleaded his innocence from the beginning, but with an all-white jury, not even two direct statements clearing his name was enough. Strickland even remained in prison while two of the four actual shooters, Vincent Bell and Kilm Adkins, admitted under oath Strickland had nothing to do with the murders. The manipulation in this case is evident from the very beginning. Excuse me? Many times over the four Bro, why is it every case they don't even have evidence of them being there? Seems like a common pattern. But then, like, cases. they still locked but them up. I feel like they just want someone locked up for play. Them. No, I didn't think this day was going to come. I mean, not before I got this legal team, I didn't. Jackson County Prosecutor Gene Peters Baker led the team who worked to free Strickland alongside the Midwest Innocence Project. In 2015, an email was received by the prosecution. The most important piece of evidence was a recantation of a witness. She has since died, um, but she really did a good job documenting um, her recantation. This so is so stupid. We believe it to be a very credible recantation. It changed her view on the entire case. Let's just call it what it is. This is wrong. Amen. And everyone that works in this system must find a way to do the right thing now. The right That's thing what I'm is saying, babe. Mr. That's Strickland what I'm saying. Like, out. Now come give Even me slots. Even with all the evidence, her first attempts to free Strickland failed. 
I guess it's not easy when you're fighting against the no, same chat. people who helped you put him there in the first place. Imagine you're living your life this process is. and you go to petrol Even station. When the prosecutor is They're on fed to pull up. They arrest you for no reason. They think months. you did a crime. Mr. Strickland to come home. They and have you on CCTV. It's, it's not you. It looks like you're on CCTV. For the 43 years and now you're being locked away for 20 that's years. That's not justice. Be honest. They what the f get do you actually do? Obviously. And with freedom at his fingertips. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing you can do. One thing. Well, I mean, I hate people to hear a 62 year old man say this, but I'm a mama's boy, and I got to go see mom. I got to go my whole mama's hand. Yep. But Attorney General Eric Schmidt had his way of slowing it down, causing that one last wish to be taken away. His mother died two months later. Uh, Cedric Hurd caused his case to be delayed and later dismissed. His mother passed away on August That's 21st. That's so sad, man. We can't bring back mum, but the people of Missouri and abroad decided that they can help in another way. He's been out of prison for more than a week. A GoFundMe has raised more than $1.7 million. Oh, that's tough. Million. That's cold. It doesn't equal 43 years, but I do think that will help keep him out of a cardboard box. That's nice, man. Maybe a little more. That's so nice. You know, I've never been on a beach. No, not, not even a man-made beach. And I'm never. Go far in the ocean where you can't see any land, any direction. And not just go out there, but get in that water. I want to feel the power mm -hmm. you know, of God's creation. Amen. Amen. Stunning development in a murder case NBC News has been following for nearly three years. On our way to see an inmate by the name of Richard Rosario. Okay. Rosario was convicted in the 1996 murder of teenager George Colazzo in the Bronx. His story the has Bronx. never changed. Did you shoot him? No. Why are you here? Sometimes I'll hear about a case that sounds so outrageous. It makes me wonder, what if it's true? One of two things was true. Either Richard was innocent, or I had a law enforcement officer right. lying to me. Yeah. I'm never gonna lose Yeah, he was hope. lying. He's home. They have to take me out of here in a box. I'll never lose hope, no matter how long I'm here. Yep. Amen. June 19th, 1996, in the Bronx, New York. Nah, I can't lie. I'd be pissed. I'd try, I'd try, I'd, I'd lie. Down in I can't even speak English, because this shit is crazy. I'll turn into Michael Schofield, try to break out the prison fam. I swear down. Witness the crime were asked to look through a lineup of photos. The man they both picked out, 20-year-old Richard Rosario, who was in Florida I State so at the time of the murder. Unbeknown to Rosario, he was now a wanted man. He gets a call from his family, explaining being wanted by the NYPD. As soon as um, my mother told me and I spoke to my sister, I spoke to my wife and I found this out, I mean, I just came back. But not back to what he expected. Within hours, he was handcuffed, arrested, and considered the sole suspect in the murder of Colazzo. He did turn himself in that night, and he did give a statement to police where he named 13 people who he said could confirm that he was in Florida, and he also gave them a copy of a bus ticket showing that he had taken a Greyhound bus from Florida. So if detectives so were given names, addresses, phone numbers of the people who could place Rosario in Florida on the day of the murder, he had all of that. How did the jury find him guilty to? Bro, years he had later? all of that. Well, if you're not a fan of corruption or injustice, you might want to look away. The newly joined exoneration initiative. He had all of that. Managed to get Darcel Clark, the new district attorney, to re-examine the case. What they found was downright dirty. Well, yeah, after I spoke with the alibi witnesses, they all told me that no one from the NYPD or the DA's office or anybody ever called them. He gave a statement to the police and gave them names and addresses and phone numbers, including yours. Did anybody ever call you? Not a single phone call. No one from uh... the NYPD called me just to confirm if what he was saying was true. We've thoroughly interviewed a number of witnesses, his alibi witnesses. We interviewed our witnesses. Just every single angle we looked into. I don't feel now that I would be able to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is the burden of proof that I must satisfy. Nah, this but is what she didn't so was fucked. One, the detectives withheld the fact that George's friend could not pick Rosario out of the lineup. And two, the food truck witness didn't even see the gunman in the first place. So you went to jail for nothing? As his family looks on, Rosario is led into the court, shackled. We can see that the defendant did not receive effective assistance of counsel. No um, way. Why did it take him so long? This shit is pissing me off. 
Because if I was in pen for that long, for something I ain't even do, I'm suing everyone. Do the right thing to exonerate me because I've been in prison for 20 years for a crime I didn't commit. My family didn't deserve this. I oh yeah, this. so their no, family had to deal with not being able to see him for 20 and years. I hope this, um, this conviction is not just vacated, but exoneration is given to me. Now there's one more moment you need to see. Nah, this so one comes fucked. with an interesting request. Rosario Man. did the unthinkable. He asked for the murder case against him to remain open until his name is clear. Okay. The should know the truth. The families of the victims should have that, that clarity and that peace of mind that, you know, a murder is not in the street and that their son received the justice that he deserved. If I had to spend every day of my life in prison to prove my innocence, I would have been prepared to do that. I'm innocent and I'm always be innocent no matter what the justice system does. Smith was a bus driver for the oh, Lorraine man. County Head I want a bus driver now. Yo, shout out all my bus drivers for getting the kids to school on time and safe, man. I feel like we don't praise bus drivers enough. It was May 7th, 1993. Taking care of all those kids. Ohio when Nancy Smith was going about her daily duties as a bus driver. Okay. Little did she know, what could her Nancy day was Smith about to like? enter a head-on collision with the level of injustice which left her in pieces. The catalyst of this collision another typical Karen. That is when they told me that a mother on Friday had made allegations against me saying that I did not take her daughter to school and that I had And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then the nightmare began. The mother claimed that the kid was taken to Joseph Allen's house, who was also described as Nancy's boyfriend. I've never met him, I've never talked to him, I never even what? seen him. Then came the trial. First of all, you read the trial transcripts and the police um, records, and the children are changing their story. I mean, when you're innocent, you don't think that, you know, that people are going to believe these lies. You know, you just think. You just it's crazy because this is the only woman on this thing, and she's also the only person who cried. That's kind of crazy. Everyone else is just like, nah, you know what? I'm going to just firm it. It's your justice system. She's out here crying. Joseph were then sentenced 15 Typical to 90 years. Typical woman, but this is so fucked. Sex abuse. What? How many years? 15 to 90 years for child sex abuse. 15 to 90? I'm going to take care of my children. So, if Nancy claims she had never met Joseph before, then something here isn't adding up. Someone isn't telling the truth. Someone? Well, someone is remember lying. that Karen we mentioned? The mother of the little girl? Yeah. Meet Margaret Grodin. How was school today? And she goes, um, well, we didn't go to school today. We went to over Joseph's house to play games. What? And, I, and I knew something was wrong right away. That was Margaret getting interviewed by local news stations. But she She's didn't a stop liar. There. Margaret also called upon all the neighboring parents and threatened Nancy with jail time. She also went as far as going to the mayor of the city, pleading for Nancy's arrest. What the fuck? The motivation here? Financial. Financial. And to solidify her investment, she stooped even lower. I've actually never seen anything like that in my entire life, where the parents and the and the officers are telling them who to pick. Why do I feel the like some police officers? Oh, okay. Specifically, I can only hear my left ear. I was bugging out. Indicating to and leading the child witness with their selection. Your stomach will drop as we reveal there's no line these people weren't willing to cross. It's sort of sick to say, but people, it appears, were making these allegations um, for monetary gain. That's the so weird, uh, that's so weird. Doors. So, case closed, right? Another unjust conviction that ruins an innocent woman's life? Not the raw emotions. Oh, yeah, even her family, they probably looked at her complaint. like they didn't look. Ah, I'm going to just shut up now. I want to say that I apologize to especially for what was done to you and to your families as a result of this ill-conceived prosecution. Yeah, that's nasty, blood. It'll always be with you. It'll nah, that's nasty, blood. I might be home and I might be free, but am I really free? This is something that oh, I'll live with yeah. for the rest of my life.